Thank you for joining me for this Lifeway study in the book of Acts, chapters 1 to 12. This is session 12. The title is Including, and the text is Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 48. The lesson summary statement is salvation comes to anyone who believes in Jesus. I'm using the Go Explore uh, idea where it talks about a Down syndrome girl in high school who received a birthday invitation and how joyous she was about it. It just will make your heart uh, feel warm and good. And it, the mother talks about how rare those kinds of invitations are for her daughter and how special it was for her to feel included. And uh, so I'm gonna show that to them and, and then I'm gonna lead from that and to say we all know what it's like to be left out of a group and to not be included. And today's Bible study will focus on Peter and a lesson he learned about including all people in the invitation to follow Jesus. And then I'm going to bring them to the lesson summary statement. Salvation comes to anyone who believes in Jesus. And I'm asking the class, who does anyone include? And I just want to list on the board uh, the various answers, men and women and children and seniors and rich people and poor people and people of all different races. And I just want to just fill the board up uh, with all of these things. And then I just want to say, look how impressive this salvation is, that this is a gospel. This is a salvation that is for the whole world. One prominent theologian said that chapter 10 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And, and when you say that, you're really saying something. When you put that up next to Romans chapter 8 and Genesis chapter 1, that chapter 10 of Acts is one of the most important passages in the Bible. Now the amount of space that Luke gives to this encounter that Peter has with Cornelius shows you that he regarded it as a watershed experience in the history of the church. In fact, he tells the story twice. Twice. First, he tells it in his own words, that's chapter 10. And then secondly, he tells it in Peter's words back in Jerusalem, and that's chapter 11. It's about Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius, we know, is a centurion. The Roman government, uh, the Roman army a legion would be about 6,000 soldiers, and that legion is divided into 10 cohorts or 10 regiments of uh, 600 men apiece. And then the regiment is broken down into six groups of 100 men, and the person that's in charge of those 100 men is called a centurion. This was uh, uh, Cornelius's responsibility. They were, they were recognized as being the backbone of the Roman army. <clears throat> the centurions are always pictured favorably in the New Testament. He was paid about five times the average pay of the soldier, so he was a man that had some wealth, he had some influence, and uh, the Jews resented him as well. We learn about Cornelius that he is a religious man, but he is not a regenerate man. And that's why Peter comes to share with him about the gospel. Uh, the first point of our lesson is offered to all, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 36. I just want to read through the text. I don't want to give any explanation stopping along the way to do that. And then I'm going to ask them, would you describe Jesus? And I'll make a list of that. And then after we've, we've made an extensive list in describing Jesus, I'm going to ask them to describe those that he came to save. And of course it's sinners and it's people who are rebels and they're traitors of God. Um, they're the disobedient and we could just go on and on with that kind of list. And then I want to point out, Jesus has nothing in common with these people. And yet Jesus came to save them. And what we're seeing is Jesus being lived out in these verses and going to people that they don't have, Peter has very little in common with, and yet they're to be included in the kingdom of God. So it's to be offered to all. Uh, and then I want to go into this explanation of this word favoritism. 
for that's the key idea in these verses. Th this word favoritism is a Greek word that translates a Hebrew figure of speech that means to lift the face. And it's the idea of somebody standing over and you lift the face and you evaluate uh, and you measure someone as if they're worthy of your attention or they're not worthy of it. The, the word favoritism was forbidden by the judges uh, in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19 verse 15 is an example of that. And the reason is the divine judge is not discriminating. Second Chronicles chapter 19 uh, verse 7, I believe it is. And so a judge is to be reflective of the heavenly judge, and that is he doesn't play favorites. When you go through this text, uh, verse 34, Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in notice this, every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right. Now hold on to that thought because we're going to see what that means in verse 43. And everyone who does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That means if he is the Lord of all, uh, the peace he brings is available to all. And, and then I just want to take a moment in our class to, in terms of applying this and just ask what segments of our community what segments of our community are missing from our church and our ministry? And I just made a, a mention of some things. We live in a college town, but we don't have a significant college ministry. Uh, single moms are a large population around us. And what kind of ministry does our church have that particularly is out to meet their needs? Uh, apartment dwellers, they tell us that uh, the largest population of unchurched people live in the apartments. They have a mentality that this is something temporary, and so I'm not really going to settle down and sink roots into things. And one of those things would be church, and yet there are apartments all around us. Um, wealthy and professional people might be a part of that group that's been left out. But, but what are the the areas of our community that are missing in our church. And then, just a question, why are they missing? Is, is, it, is it time for us to do something about that? Is there someone that could do something about it? Now the second point is through faith. Uh, I'm going to point out that the word faith and give the explanation of what biblical faith is. I've done this a number of times, but there's always someone new and there's always a need to re-emphasize and clarify the concept. But biblical faith has three aspects to it. There's knowledge, assent, and then action. In order to have biblical faith, you have to know some stuff. And that's why it's so important for us to be sharing the gospel of Christ. How will they know if they don't hear about Jesus? But then it goes beyond just knowing the information. You agree that it is the truth. Jesus is the Son of God. He did die on a cross. He was dead and he did come back to life three days later. And I believe those things to be absolutely true. So there is knowledge and there is assent, but still it's not biblical faith. It's not biblical faith until we act upon that knowledge and that truth and follow it up with our lives. And that's the evidence of something you have genuinely have faith in. Now, I call it biblical faith, but the reality is it's just the definition and the nature of faith. You have to have knowledge, you have to believe it's true, and then you act upon it. That's just the nature of faith. I'll go through that with the class, and then I'll say, let's list the historical events and what we're asked to believe in this passage. And I just want to walk through the passage and I want them to see that there's, there's truth in here about um, the events that take place. These things literally did happen. And there's truth in here about the person of Jesus. So verse 37, you know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. And so these are historical events. They can be investigated. They are um, uh, reality. And he begins with the baptism of Jesus. 
uh, with John the Baptist. What happened there? What was it that John said about Jesus? He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. And all of these stories can be investigated. Uh, His life demonstrated the power of God. His life demonstrated that he removed people from the, the terror and the terrorizing of Satan. In verse 39, we ourselves are witnesses. That's an important word in the book of Acts. We are witnesses of everything he did in the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. Peter says, we saw these things. We can testify. And there's a whole host of people behind us who affirm these things. And he, he specifies the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And notice that he calls him as being hanging on a tree. That's used four times in the New Testament. And the use of it is to associate with the concept in the Old Testament of the sign of God's judgment and curse upon sin. And Jesus took our curse. He took our judgment from God. That's the thing that's being stressed there. In verse 40, God raised him, raised up this man on the third day. So there's a dateable evidence there. And it was a divine act. God raised him up and caused him to be seen. And that is physically. He was seen. And he was seen as himself. Not by all people, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses. There's the word again. And and just to stress the physical reality of Jesus being raised from the dead, he ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. This this is real that happened. Verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he's the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. The word testify is an intensive form of witnessing. It has about it a sense of urgency. Everybody has to, has to know about this because he is the judge. That means there is an appointment for every single person to one day stand in the presence of Jesus. And he will either be your savior or he will be your judge. And so there's this urgency in Peter to prepare people before that judgment day arrives. And everyone's going to do this. When he uses the living and the dead, no one escapes this meeting. Verse 43, all the prophets testify about him that through his name, Everyone, You see how that's coming again and again? And he means Jews and Gentiles. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. Uh, Again, like I mentioned, I wanted to list the historical events and, and then also what we're asked to believe. So we're asked to, here's this historical events, and then we're asked to believe that Jesus died on the cross, took the judgment for our sin, that he literally came back to rise, life. We're, we're asked to believe that he physically was present, that he had a body, something like ours, that could eat and drink. We're, we're asked to believe that we're going to stand before him as the judge. And we're asked to believe that if we will receive him, then we can have forgiveness of sins. Now, he's, he's the one who forgives uh, the, our sins. And I want you to notice three categories in this passage. First is his identity. Uh, the, Peter tells them about Jesus. And so when we're talking to others, when we're being a witness, we need to tell them about Jesus. We need to specifically tell them about his cross and his resurrection. We need to secondly tell them about the mission of Jesus. Why did Jesus come? He came because we need forgiveness. The whole of human history and every religion and beyond that is what do we do with our guilt? There's all kinds of suggestions that have been made, offers and ways to deal with our guilt. 
We are people who know there's not, something's not right. So how do you get forgiveness? And the answer that the Christian faith is, it's through Jesus. Jesus paid it all. So you'll either pay for your sins or Jesus will pay for your sins. And when Jesus pays for your sins, then you get forgiveness. And one of the things you know that is happening in the hearts of people in your class is they're dealing with sin. They're dealing with guilt. And you have the wonderful opportunity to tell them that through faith in Jesus, they can experience peace and forgiveness and deal with their guilt. I'm going to ask the class to explain this statement. I got this from a book uh, on evangelism. If we ask Jesus to take our guilt and forgive us our sin, then we know that we have a future. Uh, let me read that again. I I'm asking the class to explain this statement. What's, what's going on here? If we ask Jesus to take our guilt and give us forgiveness, then we know that we have a future. Put it in the context of uh, people who are uh, at odds with one another. And then and they, they forgive one another. Well, when that happens, then the future is they can continue their relationship of friendship or love. So forgiveness gives us a future. And with Jesus, what does it mean that I can that I, can, I have a future. It means that he has dealt with my sin and that at death, I face an eternity with him. This, this idea of forgiveness is wonderful. So there's the identity of Jesus. Don't miss the cross and the resurrection. There's the mission of Jesus. Why did he come? He came to give us forgiveness, to deal with our guilt and to give us a hope for the future. And the third point is acceptance found, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. <clears throat> now I'm going to say to the class before we get into the text, put yourself in the place of these Jewish Christians. You've not, you've not had Peter's vision. You, he may have told you about it, but you didn't have the vision. And you're a hardcore racist. And you believe that God affirms your racism against Gentiles. So imagine this scene. It blows up your prejudice. So how does it blow it up? How, why does it blow it up? And then I want to read through the text uh, as Peter is preaching and the Holy Spirit comes down upon them. I'm wanting, I'm wanting to set up the idea of how just amazing this event is. And, and how does that deal with their rejection of Gentiles, and suddenly they have this unmistakable affirmation from God that Gentiles are equal and they can be saved. What is it that destroys their prejudice? And the answer that I'm looking for from the class is God did for them, for the Gentiles, what he had done for the Jews. What we have is a Gentile Pentecost. The same events happen. There's the coming of the Spirit. There's the speaking in tongues. And that's why Peter will say, listen, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. How could we possibly uh, withhold the, the symbolic testimony of that, of baptism? And, and so it's a powerful way of saying that, that salvation comes to anyone who believes in Jesus. And so then I'm going to simply ask, the, what kind of insights or questions do you have about the text? Uh, when we talk about salvation, we use words like faith and forgiveness and eternal life. I wonder how often when we talk about salvation, we use the word acceptance. Not, not just the fact that God has accepted the sinner, but that we as believers have accepted the sinner. One of the things we tend to fall into is wanting to get the sinner uh, to suddenly become saintly. And we need to understand that what they most need from us is acceptance. If they've genuinely come to faith in Jesus Christ, there will be things that immediately stop in their life. That's what happened to me. 
That's probably what happened to you. But there are other things that God's Spirit just leaves on us to teach us dependence upon Him. Why wouldn't that be true of some people who are coming to faith in Christ? And so what they need from us is not our judgment and our correction. Maybe that is, there's a place for that. But what they most need is our acceptance. Why don't we just go ahead and love them even when they're making mistakes that should not be in the life of a Christian? I, I hope I'm making that clear. And so I want to take the word accept, and I just want to use it as an acrostic to, to, to cast this idea that part of the work of God's people is to accept people when they come to faith in Jesus. And so using the word accept, what would be some of the words that would fit that? Uh, for example, A, uh, ages, all ages. Uh, uh, C, uh, all colors uh, uh, or characters. Uh, the word E, uh, economics, that is all financial uh, levels uh, are people that can come to faith in Christ. And P, how about personalities? All kinds of personalities. Winsome personalities and, and dull personalities and outgoing personalities and introverted personalities. Uh, pe people that are likable and people that are not so likable. People that are very normal in our view and people who are very weird <laughs> in our view. They're to be accepted. And maybe the word T means all kinds of types. Maybe that was another thing. To close the lesson, I'm going to show them the famous photograph by uh, Holman Hunt, uh, Christ at the door. You, you're familiar with it. He's knocking on the door. There's not a doorknob on the outside. The door has to be open from the inside. You can read a little bit about it and gain some insights into that door. But, but I'm wanting to show that picture to them, maybe give them a little background of it. And then I'm wanting them to use that picture to help me know how would you teach this lesson using that picture? How would, you, how would that picture help you teach this truth? Salvation comes to anyone who believes in Jesus. And what I'm really trying to do is just lock a picture into their mind to stress the idea that salvation comes to anyone, anyone, maybe the person you've given up on, Salvation comes to anyone who puts their faith in Jesus. What an important lesson. Thank you so much for teaching God's Word.